Welcome to everybody. My name is Giuseppe Joan Mas. I will chair the LaFont lecture of the 2021 European meetings of the Chromatic Society. It's an honor and a great pleasure for me to introduce Gianluca Violante, who will deliver this year's lecture. Gianluca doesn't need much of an introduction. He's one of the best known and most influential macroeconomists today. Gianluca started, got his PhD at UPN in 1997, is currently professor of economics at Princeton, and has worked also before at NYU and at UCL. Indeed, I first met Gianluca at UCL, who was studying my PhD the same year he arrived fresh from the job market. All those years, I can say that Gianluca was an incredible lecturer with an enormous fan base, even among non-academic master students. He didn't spend much time at UCL, only five years, I think, but he was able to build something special over that time. He created a small group of motivated macro students that he supervised and went on to have a nice research career afterwards. Gianluca research has touched on many different topics. He's best known for his contributions to macro labor literature and heterogeneous Asian economies. He has addressed questions like the role of technical progress on wage inequality, the effect of disingratitude shocks on consumption, savings, and welfare, the role of such frictions on inequality, or the optimal design of taxes and employment benefits. More recently, however, he has switched his focus to research on the interaction of aggregate uncertainty aggregate fluctuations and inequality, which brings us to today's topic, the uh, topic of today's lecture, about heterogeneity in marginal propensities to consume. I would say that his 2014 economic paper with Greg Kaplan, a model of the consumption response to fiscal stimulus payment, is one of the most influential papers in recent macro. I have been myself frustrated by the lack of action of inequality on aggregate dynamics, and I think big chunks of the profession share the same view. We're able to build and solve interesting and complicated models of inequality, but in the end, aggregate dynamics of those models would be similar to models with a representative agent. In these economies, most of the forward-looking smart households would be able to accumulate wealth in advance in a way that would render them well insulated against shocks. The insight of Gianluca and Greg was to split open this wealth accumulation process to distinguish between two types of assets. On one hand, high return assets, but were very illiquid. And you can think here of housing, pension and retirement accounts, or private businesses. And on the other hand, assets that were liquid, but would pay little return. This would generate in equilibrium a mass of households that would be wealthy, but would not have immediate access to their wealth. So these households would behave as hand-to-mouth agents as long as shocks they face were not large enough. On average, the model would generate then marginal potential to consume that would be larger than standard models. The final touch of the paper was to use the model to interpret structurally the existing reduced form estimates of the marginal propensity to consume out of the 2001 tax rebates in the US. I believe Gianluca will span on all this on today's lecture, so I will stop my introduction here. We will give now Gianluca 60 minutes to deliver his lecture. We pray you keep your questions for the Q&A session that comes before, where you're all invited to contribute to the discussion. Gianluca, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Joseph. Thank you, thank you very much for the um, super generous introduction. So um, yes, as Joseph said, it, it was essentially my, my first uh, ever student. Uh, I was just uh, out of grad school when I started advising at. Uh, uh, at UCL, and, uh, I have to say you were very brave you know, to, to choose me at the time. Um, I was, you know, very lucky in my career to advise a number of other great students like uh, Joseph after him and, and Greg Kaplan, my co-author on this, uh, on this uh, lecture, on this paper, is certainly one of them. And, you know, after all these years in, in the profession, I can sort of confidently say that, you know, advising students might be a, a sort of a bit more obscure part of our job, certainly uh, less uh, shiny than publishing and less shiny than giving these kind of sort of plenary lectures, but possibly it is even more rewarding to see students like, you know, Joseph and Greg and others uh, succeed and, uh, you know, climb to the uh, ranks of the profession, advise in turn their own students and so on. Um, so uh, I guess before starting, uh, let me uh, also say that I'm very grateful to uh, Aureo and uh, uh, Jan, the uh, program chairs, for this invitation. 
Uh, it's, uh, it's truly a great honor uh, to give this uh, prestigious lecture named after Jean-Jacques Lafon, who is uh, uh, surely one of the uh, greatest economists of our time and uh, uh, left us much too early. Um, okay, uh, on this note, let me, uh, let me start. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about uh, the marginal propensity to consume in macroeconomics. And as I said, the, uh, the paper is uh, joined with uh, uh, Greg Kaplan, uh, who is uh, uh, at the University of Chicago, okay? Um, I'm going to, let me just ask a, a quick question to Joseph. Joseph, do you see, you see the whole slides here or uh, you see the whole slides? Yes, yes. You do. Slide, yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. All right. Very good. So let me begin by um, uh, by a sort of uh, what is the uh, most common, I think, definition of the marginal propensity to consume. Um, so the marginal propensity to consume, uh, you can define it as how much a household spends within a given period out of a small one-time unanticipated windfall of income. Okay. Uh, so there are a couple of things that we need to define here uh, to make this definition operational. Uh, the first one is the, the period length, and I'm going to go with the quarter, uh, which is uh, a commonly used time period in uh, macroeconomics. And also I need to specify the amount, and I'm going to choose $500 uh, because it's sort of the size of the stimulus payment, actually, uh, this is what uh, Joseph was talking about. Uh, for which we have arguably the best evidence. Okay, but I'll come back on this point about the five hundred dollars versus other other sizes. Um, okay, let me just make a few notes. Um, first one is that this is the uh, marginal price to consume out of a transitory shock. Okay, and we know since Friedman fifty seven how important in consumption saving theory. Uh, to distinguish between transitory and permanent shocks. Okay? But this is going to be the, the MPC out of a transitory shock. It is the contemporaneous MPC. Um, you know, there are other interesting MPC to study, like the MPC out of the news of a uh, sum of income you receive in the future, or the delayed MPC. Again, I'll come back on this issue of intertemporal MPCs later in the talk. Also, uh, spending here um, is going to be intended to be spending on non-durable and services. So we're going to exclude uh, durables because durables are a form of saving, essentially. Okay, so that's kind of what we're talking about. That's kind of our definition. All right, so what do we do uh, in this paper uh, and why? Um, so we're going to calibrate and solve uh, many commonly used macroeconomic models, okay? Um, I mean, some of you will remember this old paper by uh, Xavier Sally Martin on growth empirics, which was called I Just Run to Million Regressions. We really can summarize this paper uh, as, you know, we just saw like 2 million heterogeneous agent models, <laughs> pretty much. Um, I'm just going to show you like a, a very small subset of those, but that's kind of what we're doing. Um, so we want to sort of solve these models and quantify the aggregate MPC implied by the model. And in particular, we want to try to analyze uh, its determinants. We want to try to understand uh, you know, if a model has a high MPC, why it has a high MPC. If a model has a small MPC, what are the reasons behind uh, this behavior? And why is this an interesting question? Um, well, first of all, because I will argue there is a tension between the data and the models. Um, it's an important tension to resolve, to be resolved. The second is that because there is some disagreement, and I would say some confusion as well among economists uh, with respect to you know, which model generates a high MPC, which model generates a low MPC. And uh, you know, we want to sort of clear up some of these uh, misunderstandings. Uh, also, the MPC is really a central concept in modern heterogeneous agent macro. Uh, and I will try to explain that uh, in a few slides. So overall, you know, we do need macroeconomic models that can reproduce the data on MPC. Uh, first of all, because it doesn't seem to be trivial, and second, because it's so important for uh, modern macro to uh, have models that reproduce uh, uh, the MPC. Okay, so I'm going to talk about now the, the distinction between data and models, and then uh, why this is uh, an important concept in, in heterogeneous agent macro. All right. So I'm going to give you first of all a, a very quick helicopter tour of the empirical evidence of the MPC. Uh, if you want to know more, there is a, a very nice survey by Yapel and Pistaferi in the uh, Indian Review of Economics. Um, 
So there are essentially three separate strands of empirical evidence on the size of the marginal price to consume. Um, the first set of papers uses um, sort of uh, you know quasi <coughs> experimental <coughs> evidence um, on the uh, marginal price to consume. <coughs> So the best known paper uh, papers, I should say, are the papers by um, uh, Jonathan Parker and co-authors that study what is the MPC out of you know, fiscal stimulus payments or economic impact payments. <clears throat> um, the, um, there are other examples also of quasi experiments. Um, another interesting one are government shutdowns. And uh, yet another one is lottery, lottery wins. Okay, there's these two papers. Um, this paper on Norway and this one recent paper on the US that study <coughs> the APC out of lottery wins. Uh, the second approach is that of designing surveys and sort of put households in hypothetical situations. Okay, so asking households, individuals, you know, if you were to receive a windfall of $500, how much would you spend on it? <coughs> and here are some of the sort of the sort of the best papers in this literature. Um, so this is sort of a self-reported marginal price to consume. And then we have structural estimates, okay? Estimates were, which are based on some structural, semi-structural models of the marginal price to consume out of transfer shop. The best known paper, a, a classic really, is Glendale Vista Ferry Preston. Uh, now this paper actually finds an NPC out of transfer shop, which is uh, quite smaller than the rest of the literature. And over time, uh, these, uh, 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 these factors in studies, and there are some, a couple of papers, in particular a paper by uh, Jean Comeau, um, that reconciles, actually explains why this is the case, and reconciles this approach also with, with the other two approaches, the quasi-experimental evidence and the self-reported indices. Okay, so, <clears throat> you know, uh, with some caveats, caveats that overall this literature you know, there's a lot of variation in, in results, but this collective, collective sort of body of evidence uh, has sort of two main findings, okay? First finding is that the quarterly aggregate or average MPC uh, out of, uh, you know, a small uh, windfall of income is between 15% and 25%, okay? So that's the kind of numbers that uh, we, uh, we need to keep in mind. Also, this literature concludes that there's some size dependence, meaning that the MPC is smaller for large income shocks and some sign asymmetry. Uh, in particular, uh, 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 sign, the sign asymmetry is to be very strong. Uh, the MPC is much bigger for negative income shocks than for, for positive income shocks. The second finding is that there is, uh, there is really a distribution of market risk to consume in the, in, the, in, the, in the data. There is large heterogeneity across households. And what is it explains this large heterogeneity? Well, uh, liquid wealth uh, is actually a, a, a pretty powerful explanatory variable when you have enough data and good enough data to measure uh, jointly uh, expenditures and liquid wealth. Okay, in particular, the MPC is declining in liquid wealth. But also fixed individual characteristics tend to be important. So when you have panel data, you find that there are some households that really, they always spend a lot and some households that always spend less. All right, so you know, overall, as I said, um, these are you know, this sort of my uh, my uh, summary of the uh, this body of, of work. Um, uh, there is much work to be done, much research to be done here, and I would say that you know, this administrative data um, from financial institutions with information on spending and transactions uh, are really the future. I think so. I'm thinking about the JP Morgan Chase data for the US or the or the affinity data that are part of the Opportunity Insight project, uh, also for the US. Okay, those kind of data are really, I think, the future to, to uh, study these questions in PIC. Okay, so that's, that's, you know, about it for, in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the data. So what about models? So, as I said, you know, the marginal price to consume is a key concept in modern heterogeneous agent macro. By modern heterogeneous agent macro, I have in mind the class of models where uh, the household block of the model features heterogeneity, income risk, and insurable income risk. So uh, income risk and imperfect risk sharing. So why is it an important concept? Well, the first 
reason is that the MPC, out of a transitory shock, clearly indicates the degree of consumption insurance in the economy or lack thereof. Okay, in a complete market model, in the simple uh, standard complete market model, that would be zero. Um, now, you take these models and you add nominal rigidities, right? And you enter the world of, uh, of heterogeneous agents, new case and model, the world of Hank. And here, uh, the size of the aggregate MPC really determines, not surprisingly, the size of the Keynesian general equilibrium multiplier. Okay. And in some of these models, I would argue, the MPC can be quite large, much larger than the representative agent model. And so the, the, this case multiplier is also much larger. And this has important implications for macro uh, because um, it means that the transmission mechanism of shocks of fiscal and monetary policy in particular uh, has to be revisited. And there is a big literature that sort of revisits the transmission mechanism of, of, of uh, fiscal and monetary policy, very recent, but it's kind of growing, and finds precisely that these sort of indirect general equilibrium effects are much, much more prominent than the direct uh, effects, uh, direct partial equilibrium effects. Okay, so it's, it's an observation, the fact that the MPC is large, there is implication for the transmission mechanism of fiscal and monetary policy. Um, we said that in the data, uh, there is a, a large variation in marginal price to consume, and also in the, these models feature a distribution of MPC. And this, this distribution of MPC is actually quite important. It's important because it determines the macro responsiveness of the economy, essentially, to aggregate shocks. Okay? And here, the key moment in the model is the covariance across households in the cross-section between the marginal risk to consume and the change in income, which is uh, generated by the shock or the, uh, the policy, okay? Every shock or every policy in these models has, tends to have sort of unequal incidence across the population. So what is important is to, to measure this covariance between the MPC and the, uh, the change in income across the population induced by the shock because that's a key source of amplification or dampening of the shock. In particular, if this covariance is, is very high, it's gonna to tend to amplify the macroeconomic shock, all right? So here's where basically the MPC become, uh, the MPC, the whole distribution of MPC become really important in this class of models. Very good, okay. So taking stock in terms of what I said so far, in the data, the MPC is sort of large and heterogeneous, these two observations have important implications for modern math. But and that's the key question that I'm going to address in the rest of the presentation. Can common macro models generate a large MPC and how? All right. So let me start from the um, sort of the, what I would call the uh, uh, you know, most basic you know, uh, version of, uh, of uh, Type of model I can think of, which is a model without idiosyncratic risk and without any borrowing constraint. Right? So the household problem is uh, just written here as follows this is a household that uh, maximizes discounted utility, uh, discounted discount factor is beta, utility is simple, CRA with curvature parameter gamma, the household uh, chooses consumption and saving, C and B, and the household can save in. Uh, only one asset, which is a non-state contingent uh, bond, okay, which, which we return return R. But there is no idiosyncratic risk and there are no worrying constraints. So the solution to this problem is straightforward. It's kind of, you can get it by pencil and paper. The consumption function is linear here, which means obviously that the wealth distribution is irrelevant for the aggregate marginal price to consume, to compute the average MPC, because the MPC is constant for everyone. In particular, this is basically how consumption looks like for M and CE, CE is for certain equivalent. Uh, the marginal risk to consume as this expression, this simple expression here. Now, uh, you look at this expression, you realize that you said gamma equal one, log utility, then the marginal risk to consume becomes basically one minus beta, which is approximately the discount rate in this economy, okay? So with that, say a plausible quarterly calibration of this model, where you know, the, the, the annual discount rate is around 
uh, in quarterly discount rate is 0.5%, you get a marginal propensity consume of 0.5%. Right? This is about 30, 40 times smaller than our target NPC. And you know, this result also explains why you know, representative agent macro, basically the entire representative agent macro, features a very, very tiny NPC, because that's, you know, uh, uh, these are class of models that have no idiosyncratic risk, no modeling constraint whatsoever, where essentially the, 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 um, the uh, consumption function is basically linear in wealth. All right, so our first main takeaway of today's lecture. Um, can macro models generate an NPC? Well, the representative agent model, the answer is a resounding no. Uh, and that's the reason why, you know, rank models have a very negligible general equilibrium uh, propagation. All right, so let's move on. Let's move on to the, what I call the canonical one asset heterogeneous agent model. Um, so here, uh, the, the key uh, um, sort of element of the economy becomes what is called in the literature, you know, sort of uh, uh, Sargent, Newbis and Sargent in their textbook called the income fluctuation problem. This is basically the same problem as before uh, with two differences. The first difference is that uh, there is an expectation here. And there is an expectation because we have idiosyncratic income risk, an insurable income risk. This YT is stochastic. It follows some stochastic process, okay? But it's uninsurable, meaning that there are no state contingent assets in this economy. There is still the same one period non-state contingent asset with rate of return R, but now we're adding a no borrowing constraint, all right? It's really not important for the NPC, and I can, I can you know, if you're not convinced, we can talk about this later, that uh, this is a, a zero. It can be like a hard uh, uh, minus something, uh, but that doesn't really matter too much for the NPC. Okay, so that's kind of the, the problem. Now you take um, a continuum of these agents. Okay, you assume that beta r is less than one, okay? so that you have a, 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 a compact uh, asset space, and you can uh, uh, compute a stationary uh, distribution. Um, stationary distribution, what I call it mu, is a distribution over the two state variables of this economy when you write it in recursive form, which are assets uh, B and income Y. All right, so let's take this economy and let's parameterize the economy. Um, I'm going to again choose sort of a quarterly, uh, a quarterly uh, uh, model. So the period is one quarter. I'm going to assume a log utility. Okay, I'll come back on this uh, point later, gun equal one. And I will assume a very standard uh, a process for um, income dynamics. You know, one that is been used in this macro literature for decades. Uh, persist, excuse me, the sum of a persistent plus transitory component that we estimate for the PSA. Also, I'm going to um, uh, sort of work in partial equilibrium because we want to control the interest rate in our experiments. This, okay, doesn't really matter. Again, doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, it's useful to, to be able to sort of control the interest rate and treat it as a parameter. And uh, I will, and this is very important, I will set beta, the discount factor, to match the aggregate well to income ratio of 4.1. This is an annual ratio. So the ratio of wealth to annual income around four from the survey of consumer finances, okay? And you know, in all the economies that I'm going to um, uh, solve, uh, unless I specify otherwise, I'm going to set this discount factor so that it matches the, uh, this aggregate wealth income ratio. Okay, so sort of, kind of every, every economy uh, is consistent with, the, with this uh, very important moment of the data. Great. Okay, that's kind of the economy that we're, um, we're laying out. Now, um, let me define what is the, uh, formally the individual NPC and the, uh, the aggregate NPC in this economy. So the individual NPC for a household with state B and Y is uh, defined as follows. Basically, you know, we're comparing the spending of an individual that receives these extra X units of income uh, to the spending of an individual who doesn't receive it. 
right? So when X is very small, this becomes a partial derivative of the consumption a policy function with respect to wealth. So that's individual NPC. How do we go from the individual NPC to the aggregate NPC? Well, you take the NPC function, you integrate it under the stationary distribution, and you get the aggregate NPC, M bar. And you can see from this um, expression here that there are two key determinants of the aggregate NPC. Okay, and I'll come back, you know, over and over on this point. The consumption function, the shape of the consumption function, which determines the shape of the NPC function here, and the wealth distribution here, okay? Or the shape of the wealth distribution. All right, so uh, in light of you know, this observation, uh, we can now better understand what determines the aggregate NPC in the canonical one asset model. First of all, the shape of the consumption function, okay? And, and why, and why you know, this differs from the kind of representative agent model uh, or the certain equivalence model. Um, the first is the shape of the consumption function. And you know, as explained very clearly uh, by uh, Chris Carroll in a number of papers, in particular, this one, which is the Journal of Economic Perspective 2001 that I really encourage you to read if you don't know, because it's, it's, it's really it's a brilliant, super clear paper. Um, you know, the, the shape of the consumption function is uh, 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 determined by, the, by one uh, key feature of this model. This model has an insurable income risk. An insurable income risk leads to a precautionary saving motive, okay? Precautionary saving motive is basically, you know, saving for the rain day, if you allow me. Uh, the precautionary saving motive is due to two forces in this class of models. The first one is a feature of preferences, prudence, okay? positive third derivative. The second one is precisely the borrowing constraints. The fact that you know, there are potentially binding borrowing constraints in this economy and uh, households want to uh, sort of avoid hitting the borrowing constraint, so they save a little bit more in order to stay far away from the borrowing constraint. Uh, now, the strength of the precautionary saving motive is decreasing in wealth in this class of models. That's very intuitive, right? I mean, if you have a lot of wealth, you're very far from the borrowing constraint, then you're not really worried about saving a little bit extra uh, in order to uh, stay even further from the borrowing constraint. But if you are very close to the, to the, to the constraint, then you really don't want to hit it because hitting the borrowing constraint means basically that you know, your consumption is at mercy of uh, income fluctuations and with, with potentially large welfare losses. Um, and so uh, for low levels of wealth, the precautionary setting is strong, for high levels of wealth is, is, uh, is, uh, uh, is small. And this implies that the consumption function is concave, okay? The consumption function is clearly increasing in wealth, but it's also concave in wealth precisely because of the precautionary setting motive that is decreasing in wealth which means that the NPC is decreasing in wealth. So in these models, you have high margin of price to consume near zero or near the borrowing constraint. And then the margin of price to consume tends to fall and asymptotes to the certain equivalent case, the, the expression that I showed you earlier. All right. Now, also the shape of wealth distribution matters to determine the aggregate NPC. Clearly, you know, the bigger uh, the, the mass at the bottom, where the consumption function is concave and the NPC is high, the larger is going to be the aggregate NPC. In particular, you know what what matters in this in these models is how many hand to mouth households you have. Hand to mouth households are really the constraint house. The households at, at zero, pretty much, uh, with, a, with with an NPC essentially equal to one. Okay, so. Uh, this is what determines the overall aggregate NPC in, in this model. Okay, good. So we're ready to study to study this model and to compare it with the uh, uh, certain equivalent model. So you calibrate the model, you parameterize it the way I just explained, and you get a marginal price to consume of 4.6%. Uh, 
Now, 4.6% is 10 times bigger than the certain equivalent. So, you know, that's a big uh, success in some ways, but we're still pretty far from our target uh, NPC of, you know, 15, 20, 25 percent. So let's try to understand a bit more about, uh, uh, about how, what is that gives this 4.6 percent. So here, I'm, I'm doing, I'm reporting the results of the composition. You can do the composition within the model where you split, basically, uh, the gap between the two models here, uh, the 4.6% minus 25%, 4.1, uh, among the role of uh, prudence, the borrowing constraint, and the presence of end to mouth. Okay, so these two basically, uh, 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 they, they, they sum up to the role of the consumption function, and these, if you like, the role of the distribution. So what you see is that actually the main reason why uh, this uh, model has a high amount of to consume is the presence of the borrowing constraint, the presence of these occasionally binding borrowing constraints that induce um, uh, this sort of precautionary saving model. Um, okay, good. So um, in this plot, um, in this graph, I'm plotting uh, the MPC function, which is the black line here, together with the wealth distribution. Okay, the sum of all these bars is one. So I'm basically I'm showing you like how how the uh, distribution of wealth looks like in this model, with uh, this brown area being sort of the the, the number of hand to mouth households in this economy. So basically, you know what you see is that you know the MPC function. Uh, converges very, very quickly towards a certain equivalent, uh, NPC. Okay? So at levels of uh, uh, wealth around already like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 is basically already, you know, very, very small. Um, let me just uh, um, uh, note something. One here, remember, is basically wealth equal to average income. Average income is economy is around $70,000, okay? So, you know, what you see here is that there is that actually most of the households are in a range uh, where the NPC is basically flat and very, very low. Okay, that's why you get a relatively low NPC. So there are two issues in this economy. One is that there is a lot of wealth. There is a lot of wealth. And so because there's a lot of wealth, self-insurance works very, very well on average and households have a, have a low NPC. The, house, the, the second problem, uh, problem feature, to say, is that households uh, in this economy, they really want to escape the borrowing limit, okay? There are really very few households at the borrowing limit. So households want to escape the borrowing limit because it's costly and they, they save in order to uh, uh, move far away from it. So um, overall, the NPC is very small. Um, let me just report some key statistics that I'm going to uh, discuss later. The first one is that you know mean wealth is uh, 4.1 as in the data. Median wealth is actually matched pretty well. Okay, this is important. I'll come back on this later. And but the share of hand to mouth households is very small. The model has a hard time generating a lot of hand to mouth households because precisely this very strong force that households want to get away from the constraint. All right, good. So um, we said the first problem is there is a lot of wealth in this economy. So what if we target a lower level of aggregate wealth? So here, I'm going to compare the baseline model with two economies. One, where we target a much lower level of wealth, like 0.5 of average wealth, okay? So um, 0.5 is about almost 10 times smaller than uh, the amount of wealth in the economy. And the second calibration is kind of very similar. We're targeting the share of end to mouth households in the data, which is for around 14%, okay? So these are households that have net worth basically around zero or negative. Okay, in both cases, you see that the model can generate large NPCs, 14% and 22%, okay? And you see from, um, okay, I, I, I have to explain what, uh, uh, what panel A is. So in panel A, 
uh, we do again a, a decomposition in which we compare um, the models that uh, um, I'm going to talk about with the baseline one asset model. And I basically split uh, the gap in the MPC between uh, basically what is accounted for by the fact that the MPC function is different across the two models and the fact that the distribution is different across the, the wealth distribution is different across the two models. Right? So there are all the, all the, the, the MPC function, the consumption function, the concavity basically, and the distribution. And then there is an interaction uh, term left. So you see that in both of these um, exercises, it's the distribution that plays the biggest role. But, I mean, almost, you know, by, by, by definition, these two economies are very, very uh, small wealth, 0.5 and 0.3 relative to 4.1. So how do they look like, these economies? Well, you see, basically, they can generate a large marginal propensity to consume because, uh, you know, wealth is essentially shifted uh, to the bottom of the distribution, okay? So basically here we have almost 70% of households uh, because average wealth is, uh, is very, very small in, in these economies. So, you know, you can, you can say, well, success because we can get an average MPC of, you know, 14, 20%, but these economies have a big problem. The problem is that they miss almost 90% of total wealth in the economy. Right, and uh, you know this is a it's a serious problem for macroeconomics because uh, basically you cannot analyze production economies uh, with capital. With capital, um, so it's really almost impossible, you know, to investigate questions say about housing or investment or uh, asset pricing. Um, so uh, it's a sort of a model of limited interest. Uh, if you like, um, where a number of questions cannot really be investigated. So, so we said uh, the canonical problem has two problems. Uh, the canonical model has two problems. One is uh, too much wealth, too much in quote, and the other problem is that you have these households that sort of want to escape the bottom constraint. So let's focus on the second problem. Um, before doing that. Uh, let me just get sort of the second uh, uh, takeaway of, uh, of the lecture, which is the canonical one asset model uh, can only generate uh, high MPC by neglecting 90% of total wealth. So, you know, how do entice households basically to stick around the bottom limit uh, and to solve uh, the second problem of the canonical model? Well, the simplest way, really, is to add exact heterogeneity. Um, you can add heterogeneity in uh, discount factors, rates of return, uh, or in the intertemporal series substitution. Okay, these are all parameters. I don't know if you remember, but they really were and they entered the formula for the MPC um, uh, for the for the certain equivalent case. Okay, so it's kind of intuitive that they're going to sort of Remember that the MPC for certain equivalent case is where the, the MPC asymptotes. So if you can push that up, then the whole MPC function is going to sort of shift upward, and that gives you a better chance of uh, generating a high MPC. So if you add exact heterogeneity in these dimensions, basically it allows you to introduce types with high MPC and low wealth that are going to push up the aggregate MPC. But at the same time, in this economy, you're going to have other types that hold most of the aggregate wealth in the economy. Okay, so you're not going to have the problem that these models generate uh, a low aggregate wealth. Uh, uh. All right. So you know, in some way, one way to put it is you need to sort of two stones to kill two birds. Okay, one stone is not enough. Um, so you need basically you know, a type that uh, uh, that that sort of uh, hangs around near the bottom constraint as high MPC and a type that holds a lot of the wealth. So um, let me uh, start by um, uh, an economy with heterogeneous discount factors. Okay, so I'm going to write down this economy that has a symmetric unimodal uh, beta distribution uh, with these values essentially. 
Okay, so what I do is I choose this value, central value again to, to match the uh, uh, total weight in the economy. So the economy has always a weight of 4.1. Now, this economy can generate a high NPC, as you can see, okay, 18.6% uh, of quarterly NPC. This is you know, right in the range of the data. Um, there is a big gap with the baseline, 14%. And you can see again that this gap is mostly due to the different wealth distribution relative to the um, canonical model. But, okay, I said that mean wealth is matched. Notice the share of end to mouth is also uh, uh, much better relative to the, uh, to the one in the, in the one asset model. So 14% is basically the data, but this model has another problem. The problem is that median wealth, which sort of in the data is around, the data is around, as I uh, told you earlier, 1.6, and in the canonical model is 1.3, median wealth now is 0.2. Okay? So uh, let me uh, explain this point. So this is the, um, basically, the, you know, it's the wealth distribution in this model with the NPC of the uh, low beta type, which is this one, the impatient type, and the, and the patient type are here. So what you see is that mechanically, the way this model can generate a large MP NPC is because these impatient types have a high NPC, and they have a high NPC everywhere, okay? Even, even here, right, because they're impatient. Uh, so they always consume a lot. Um, and they're amassed at the bottom. So overall, you know, if you sort of integrate these values of the NPC uh, times uh, the, the share of the impatient types, that can push the, the NPC high. But, but the model has this feature that we call the impoverished middle. Okay. Essentially, the median household in this economy is way too poor compared to the data, right? So, you know, see the median household is basically in this first bar of the Instagram. Um, and uh, uh, it should be here, here. It should be around, you know, like 1.5, 1.6. Um, so instead of having basically $100,000, it has sort of, you know, $10,000, okay? Uh, that's the, where the model fails. And why is this failure important? Because in this model, um, you know, there are completely wrong distributional effects of shocks and policies to asset portfolios. Okay, think about this model and think about basically shocks that change that induce the kind of capital gains or changes in rates of return on assets and so on. Then. You know, in, in, in sort of in this model, you get completely the, the wrong distribution effects from from, uh, from these these uh, these forces because the median household, instead of having you know hundred thousand dollars, is basically uh, um, ten thousand ten thousand uh, dollars. So we call this this problem the impoverished middle, and um, this problem arises uh, also for other types of heterogeneity. Um, let me talk briefly about the uh, heterogeneous uh, IES case, right? So instead of introducing heterogeneity in uh, um, discount factors, now let's uh, generalize preferences. We go from CRA to extensive, which allows us to control separately CRA and IES. And okay, the first conclusion, which is just gonna state very briefly, is that heterogeneous risk aversion has basically no impact on the aggregate NPC. The heterogeneous risk aversion is really interesting and important. Uh, for example, a nice paper by uh, my colleague uh, Maurice Lennon and Rowan Kekre uh, to understand the, the effect of asset prices in these sort of hank economies. But it really has no impact whatsoever on the distribution of NPCs. What matters is the distribution of the intertemporal single substitutions instead. You can see this from XNZ when you split risk aversion or IES. Okay, so now let's look at an economy that has an IES uh, distribution like this, okay? So a central point of one, then some very, very elastic people, IES of 20, and some very, very inelastic people, 
This economy has very similar properties to the heterogeneous data that I just showed you. A high MPC, and unfortunately, also this economy has a very, very small amount of median wealth. Okay, so, you know, the plot for the MPC functions and the, the wealth uh, distribution looks again very similar. So you have these uh, high IES people, very elastic people with high MPC, which are master at the bottom, that actually have high MPC uh, throughout the distribution. But uh, you know what, what's happening basically is that um, the, the high uh, IES people are pushed towards the, uh, the bottom of the uh, wealth distribution, and they overall on average, hold very, very small amounts of wealth because they just don't want to save, they just want to consume right away, which leads again to this impoverished middle uh, problem. The median household is way too poor compared to the data. <clears throat> All right, and this takes us to the uh, main takeaway number three, which is that uh, models with uh, this moderate, I call it example heterogeneity, uh, they feature this problem. But you may ask, is there really no form of heterogeneity, exact heterogeneity whatsoever that works? Well, clearly the answer is no. There is some that works. And let me, you know, very intuitively give you one case uh, that works. You know, you really need to go towards, for, uh, to kill basically this impoverished middle problem, you need to go to an extreme form of preference heterogeneity. Um, <clears throat> basically, to go to so-called spender-saver models. Okay? So write down a model where you have 14% of households, which are the hand to mouth households in the data, in terms of net worth, which are very impatient, say a very low beta, beta close to zero. And the rest, 85%, 86%, they have a discount factor that is calibrated as usual to match the aggregate well to income ratio in the economy around 4.1. Okay. Now, the spender saver model gives you a pretty high MPC, 16, 17%. Why? Well, because you have this 14%, basically, where MPC is essentially one, that already. Uh, you know, give, push, pushes the average MPC to 14%. And then you have the rest, 85% uh, that, uh, that have a, a kind of a low, a low MPC, and you get to about 70%. Um, now, this model has the right amount of wealth and has the right amount of median wealth as well. That's not surprising here, right? Because really you have this 86% of households that behave like in the canonical model. And the canonical, it's a lot of house, and the canonical model essentially was giving you the right median wealth. Okay, so you have the right MPC, the right median wealth, um, you know, and uh, that's kind of how the, the distribution looks like. You see that uh, uh, the distribution looks actually quite similar to the, to the one asset, uh, the one asset model. Now, you may say again, well, that's great news. That's kind of success. We, we match, we don't have the, the, this impoverished middle problem. We have a high MPC. So what's wrong with this model? Well, in this model, you have basically the entire average MPC is driven by these like 15, 14% of households that essentially display uncontrolled spending out of any amount of resources, okay? So you give them any amount of resources and they would spend everything right away. They will spend everything, say, within a quarter, even faster, in fact, if you write them, uh, like, say, a continuous time model. Um, so the question is, is it a useful model to analyze, for example, fiscal and monetary policy? You know, one implication of this model is that huge transfers aimed at the wealth poorest that the 10% wealth poorest in the economy have really the biggest bang for the buck, much more than, say, a check of $1,000, $2,000 distributed more evenly across the population. You know, do we believe that 
when you start scaling up the transfer so much, households behave so uh, myopically in a way, spending everything so quickly. You know, I leave you with, with sort of this question. Uh, so the spender saver model uh, has this, what I think is a, a, a problem, a shortcoming, that you have these few hand to mouth households with really sort of uncontrolled spending. Okay, so where do we go from here? Um, so what we want is a version of the heterogeneization model with a large MPC and you know, aggregate wealth in the data, no impoverished median household, and end to mouth households with plausible consumption saving behavior. So we start from the following observation that no, not all household wealth in the economy is immediately available for consumption moving. And in fact, it's useful to distinguish liquid from illiquid assets in household portfolios. And this is in line with the evidence that the MPC declines in liquid wealth. Okay, so we write down a model with two assets continual households that face uninsurable idiosyncratic income shocks. They choose consumption, saving, and portfolio allocation. Portfolio allocation between two assets, what we call a liquid asset and an illiquid asset, with a rate of return gap between the two assets. Clearly, the higher rate of return on the liquid asset compensates for the liquidity. And I want you to think of the liquid asset as basically cash, deposits, bank account, and also directly held mutual funds, stocks and bonds, net of uh, unsecured uh, credit. And in liquid housing, in liquid, I'm sorry, in liquid wealth, as you know, uh, uh, Joseph was mentioning earlier, housing equity, retirement account, private equity, and keeping in mind that this is essentially 85% of net worth, is the bulk of net worth in the economy. Then we're going to have a fixed transaction cost <clears throat> to move funds into and out of the liquid account. And in this version of the model, but this is not essential, we're adding a rebalancing opportunity that follows a Poisson process. And also, we assume a no short sale constraint on both assets. So you cannot go short on the liquid and the liquid asset. All right, so in this economy, uh, the wealthy and two households emerge endogenously. So there are three types of households populate the model. The unconstrained, the poor and two mouth households, which are the ones that basically hold zero net worth, which are about 14%, the one I was talking about earlier. But then we have this additional type, the wealthy and two mouth, that have approximately zero liquid wealth, okay, but can have like substantial holdings of illiquid wealth. And those are about 25% uh, in, the, in the US economy. So you may wonder why the wealthy and two mouth? Why holding zero liquidity and some illiquid wealth at the same time? Well, it turns out that there is a trade-off in holding illiquid wealth between the higher return on the asset and the illiquidity, precisely. You know, there is basically a trade-off between the long-run gain that stems from the higher level of consumption than the higher rate of return guarantees and the short-run cost which is basically the fact that because most of your wealth is tied up in an illiquid asset, you have worse consumption smoothing opportunities. So it's a trade-off between these two forces. If gains exceed the cost, as actually turns out to be in most of our calibrations, then you have this a lot of you know, substantial amount of wealth into mouth emerging. The more the gains exceed the cost, the more wealth into mouth outflows you have in the economy. All right. So uh, now take this model and run with it. So we're going to solve it in continuous time. Um, I'm going to set a couple of parameters exogenously. I'm going to set the liquid rate basically to a zero nominal, so minus 2% real. And uh, I'm going to assume a rebalancing rate of four, which means basically that every quarter on average households have the opportunity to rebalance. And then I am going to choose the discount factor, the illiquid rate and the transaction cost to match mean wealth, the total amount of end to mouth in the economy, and the wealthy end to mouth houses, the share of wealthy end to mouth houses. Okay? The model wants a pretty moderate transaction cost, $700, and a rate an annual, annualized rate of return on the liquid assets around 5%. So, kind of reasonable parameters. Okay, so this version of the model 
gives you an NPC of 14%. So without any heterogeneity, uh, with the right amount of total wealth, with sort of the right amount of median wealth as well. And, you know, kind of hitting almost by, by calibration the, the share of total income housing in the economy, which are now a lot more than in the one asset model. Now, notice that uh, if you compute the, the gap, what is it accounts for, what is it explains the gap between the two asset MPC and the one asset MPC? It's um, the distribution, obviously, all, they always kind of plays a role, but here the MPC function is actually uh, particularly important. Okay, I'm gonna explain it in a second. Okay, so here, here's the, the, the plot of the MPC function and the, the wealth distribution in the two asset model against now liquid wealth, okay? Against liquid wealth. Because what matters for the size of the MPC in this economy is really not total wealth, but it's liquid wealth. It's the amount of the distribution of liquid wealth. So in this economy, there are two things that are important. The first is that you have this wealthy end to mouth, okay? So over one third of households, a very high MPC, which is sort of this brown, uh, re group right here, which is really all concentrated here around zero, okay, with an MPC essentially of one. But also, there are a lot of households here with relatively small amount of liquid wealth. I mean, in the data, in the data, median liquid wealth is four thousand dollars, and for example, two you know two thirds of households have less than ten thousand dollars of liquid wealth. Okay, so. Liquid wealth is low, and that kind of pushes up the, the NPCs because most of the households are around here. But they're around here in terms of liquid wealth. In terms of total wealth, this is actually illiquid wealth, which is almost total wealth. The distribution is, you know, kind of in line with the data. Uh, and what you can see from, uh, from this plot is that you know, the MPC function is actually quite flat as a function of illiquid wealth. So illiquid wealth is not very meaningful in determining the, uh, the, the MPC, which might explain why some of these results in, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, empirical work where we don't find really big differences in the MPC between uh, rich and poor, if you measure wealth uh, as an aggregate wealth. What is interesting, uh, I think, is that you see that the MPC remains high also for households with sizable liquid wealth. Why? Well, first of all, because you have hand to mouth households everywhere. And second, because even those households who are not hand to mouth, they, they actually hold relatively small liquid wealth. And so they're always on the concave, um, relatively concave region of the, of the uh, consumption function with respect to liquid wealth. Okay, um, that's it. So that's kind of one uh, 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 kind of big result of the two asset model. So in my remaining like three, four minutes, um, let me talk about uh, uh, some, some other features of, of this model. Um, you know, in this model, you can compute the MPC out of illiquid income as well. So consider now a windfall of $500 into the illiquid account, okay? So I want you to think of this as a small capital gain, say on housing wealth or, you know, on uh, uh, private equity or on stocks held in your retirement account. Now, the model yields an aggregate quarterly MPC of less than 2% on illiquid wealth. So there's a big difference between the MPC out of illiquid wealth and out of liquid wealth in this model as it should be, or should be. Uh, this 2% is really comparable, right, to estimates of MPC, empirical estimates of MPC, out of, say, of housing equity, for example. That's kind of the, the, the counterpart in the data. And here, are like two estimates from two uh, well-known paper, um, you know, 2% to 1.5%. Uh, this is the near run Sufi on the, on the great recession uh, quarterly. Okay, so the model is sort of pretty much on target in terms of the APC out of uh, the concept of illiquid wealth in the, in the economy, which is also a plus. Okay, so overall, uh, the two asset model is more successful uh, without basically featuring any of these uh, three shortcomings because uh, it has all the wealth, 
Uh, it doesn't have this impoverished middle problem, and it doesn't have end to mouth with uncontrolled spending. So let me talk about uh, a couple of other things, a couple of the features of the two asset model or the two one asset model I think are interesting. One is uh, what uh, Eau Claire and co authors call the intertemporal indices. So in dynamic macro models, it's really the entire time profile of the margin to consume that matters for the response of the macroeconomy to shocks or to policy, right? Um, we talked about the contemporaneous NPC only, but you know, uh, in this economy, these macroeconomies in general equilibrium, when a shock hits, you know, your interest in the anticipated response, if there are some news about the shock beforehand, and in the in the whole uh, impulse response function. Here, what I am uh, uh, plotting, I'm plotting the one asset that the entire path of NPCs, basically in the temporal NPCs, uh, in the one asset model, in the spender saver model, which is the red line, and in the two asset model, which is the, the, the yellow line. So compare first the spender saver with the blue line, the one asset model. Okay? The spender saver has this intuitively, this very you know, sharp cusp, um, cusp shaped intertemporal NPCs. Basically, it gets, it gets you only a strong response at impact because it's only the, the, really the, save, the spenders that spend a lot at impact. But then there's really no propagation whatsoever. The two asset model gives you actually a lot more shock propagation, um, both in terms of you know, anticipation effects and in terms of like delayed response with respect to the uh, the, the, the spender saver, and clearly with respect to the canonical model, it is basically flat um, everywhere. I also mentioned in the beginning the size and sign asymmetries in the margin of risk to consume, uh, the empirical evidence, right? So here I want to tell you briefly about what are the features of, of, of all these models in terms of like, size and sign asymmetries. Uh, so here in this row, you have the contemporaneous NPC to $100 that I mentioned. Here you have the NPC out of minus $100, so a negative amount, and here $5,000. So this is sign asymmetry, and this is size asymmetry. So you know, I'll give you a second to uh, look at this table. You have the one asset model here, the low weight calibration. Here's the model with heterogeneity in uh, uh, elastic substitution, spender saver, and two asset model. All the model display the correct size and sign dependence because of concavity, because of the concavity of the uh, consumption function, right? So you go negative, the NPC is higher, you go bigger, the NPC is smaller. But what is interesting is that the sign dependence is much, much stronger in the two asset model than in all the other models. And this is actually very much in line with all the empirical evidence. At least the self-reported NPC from surveys, they all display very sharp sign asymmetry. But the two-asset model gives you also this additional feature. Okay, that's it. The, the journey is pretty much over. Um, so uh, we started from the following question: Can macro models generate a high NPC and how? And you know, uh, through this talk, I went through this sort of many, many models that we solved. Uh, uh, we did sort of this systematic investigation where uh, what is useful, I think, I hope, is that the model comparison is sort of harmonized. So the models are all comparable to each other. We concluded that, you know, the representative agent model is really a non-starter. One asset models, in all the variation, they struggle a little. And the two asset model is a better benchmark, we think, to build further. And build how? Well. The, the sort of three next steps on our agenda are investigating models, two asset models with exact heterogeneity along the lines, for example, of the RBS and bar, model with present bias along the lines of this uh, recent paper by my co author Ben Moll, and uh, adding temptation and self control also. So, kind of adding, you know, these behavioral biases that uh, I'm happy to talk about it in the QA later. We think. Uh, they might help actually um, in, in, in various respects. And thank you very much for listening. Very good. Thanks a lot, Gianluca, for a great talk.
So now we open up the Q&A session. So I think the most operative thing is like people raise their hands and Angeluca will, will like lead the discussion. Yeah, Luca, it's, it's your choice to... My choice to what? Sorry, I don't see the Q&A. Oh, I'm supposed to see the Q&A? You no, know, the, in, in the participants list, you see the raised hands and you oh, can... Oh, uh, sorry, sorry. I, I, uh... Okay, yes, I... Uh... Yeah, well, I see you. I see, I see you. <laughs> that's all, yes, that's yes. what I'm seeing at the moment. Yeah. Just a short question. Uh, uh... Among the model failures you're, you're documenting, or the, 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 the benchmark model you're using, it's very, it's very clearly absent the life cycle model. So number of people with zero wealth varies a lot by age, both in the models and the data, and I suppose there's response of consumption to check also. What do you have to say about the NPCs, transition uh, of NPCs with life cycle models? Okay, so one thing that I, I should have mentioned is I, I forgot when I described the model. We don't have a, a, a proper um, um, age as a, really as a state variable in the model, but we have um, kind of a Blanchard-Yari, kind of a perpetual use model. So there is an infinite horizon, but there is a, um, a death rate um, so that we sort of keep the average death, <coughs> sorry, the average lifespan of the uh, of the households around, uh, forgot exactly, I think it's about uh, 50 years. Okay, so there is in that sense, a um, a limit, you know, on average to how much basically you can sort of accumulate well, for example. But we don't have, you're right, we don't have the, uh, the life cycle dimension. Um, so, when I, you know, from what I remember about the, the, the life cycle models that I saw about one asset and two asset, I mean, in these models, you do get uh, basically what you would expect that there is a bit of a sort of a time horizon effect, um, where as you get, as you all, as you age and you get older, you get close to the uh, uh, you know, your capital T, so to speak, uh, the margin of consume increases uh, because your um, your horizon is uh, is shorter. Um, whether this effect is uh, uh, as strong as in the data, uh, that I don't know. But I would I would add that you know if I want to start thinking seriously about the MPC by age, and in particular you know the MPC at uh, um, late in life. Then I would think, it, precisely in the in the spirit of uncertainty and precautionary saving, would be very important to add other sources of uncertainty, like for example, stuff that you worked on, like health, uh, you know, medical expenditures and so on. Because we know from your work, from the work of Victor, from the work of Maria Cristina Denardi, and, and and so on, how important that is as a source of precautionary saving, uh, and therefore how that can shape. The MPC late in life. I think actually that's a, that's a really interesting um, um, uh, avenue of research. That uh, there are many papers on uh, kind of late in life savings, but I'm not seeing anything on the MPC in particular. I think Aura wanted to ask a question. Um, yes. So. Oh, uh, Joseph, you have to unmute him. And you're mute now. Yes, so I need to mute, unmute. Okay, so allow to talk, Aurea. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for the excellent presentation, Gianluca. Uh, I was actually quite uh, intrigued by the interplay between the elicited or self-reported uh, MPC and, and, and the findings in the model that you uh, used to highlight the asymmetry in um, in the reactions, depending uh, on whether the shock is positive or negative. Mm -hmm. I guess on one hand, I'm not very familiar with those papers, but you know, it says that we should elicit MPCs out of uh, liquid and illiquid acids. But I also also wondering if it is possible to use further features of those data, like the the distribution of MPCs that are reported along the uh, wealth distribution, to uh, you know validate the results of the model or even further discipline them. 
what do you see, what do you think uh, could be roles for those types of data in this type of studies? No, I think, so uh, the, the literature on the self-reported NPCs um, started uh, quite a long ago actually, but it, it sort of um, picked up later um, in, in the last few years. I think because we sort of realized precisely, as you're saying, Ariel, that you really have to be extremely careful and extremely specific uh, in the way you ask the question, you frame the question. Okay. So, for example, the first surveys were, you know, how much would you spend out of a thousand dollars? Okay. That did not specify the time frame. That did not specify um, the type of spending, whether it was on durable, non durables, and you know, so they're only partially useful. The new generations, for example, paper by my co author Greg, uh, are much, 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 much better uh, because they're much more precisely in specifying the, in basically framing the situation in which the, uh, the household uh, has to be in order to um, answer questions that are useful for the model. And, and, as you, and I think there is, it, it's, you know, I'm completely in agreement with you. It's, it's, it's very exciting. Um, and there is a lot of, uh, I think, additional uh, uh, refinement in the type of question that one can ask uh, in order to, you know, try to uh, compare the model with the data. And uh, some of these, some of these um, surveys, they do ask questions about uh, uh, liquid, wealth, mm -hmm. liquid wealth, and they tend to find precisely this effect that um, uh, the NPC is declining in liquid wealth. For example, I mind the paper by. Um, uh, Luigi Pistaferi on Dutch, uh, Dutch data, that I, one of the papers that I cited. That's very interesting, very promising. Thank you. I think Jan has a question. Jan Eckhout. Gianluca, thank you very much for the uh, presentation. I really enjoyed it. I wanted to uh, ask a question pushing a little bit further this two asset uh, idea also into the consumption side because uh, you can think of durable goods mm -hmm. as having kind of that two asset idea and then because in consumption you know s some of the durable goods also have an immediate consumption component right of course it's going to go over right. periods, and, and you would expect that many of these hand to mouth people are going to spend it often on durables when there's an, uh, 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 an unexpected uh, income shock so have you thought about using that? Of course, in measurement, it's going to change the MPC as well. But in, in terms of modeling also, have you thought about how to introduce that? OK, no, that's a great question. I think eventually um, it is really, I should have, in fact, I, I really should have listed this as, a, as a, um, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the points that we should investigate. Because, um, you know, do, because, because of precisely because durables are so important in business cycles. Uh, you know, small durables are larger than cars, <laughs> just to mention one, but also small, smaller durables. Uh, they are so important in business cycles, they're so important in the in, in understanding and uh, uh, and uh, um, understanding business cycle dynamics. Um, so I, I completely agree with you. Now, one, uh, um, I would say, you know, one complication is that you really, basically, this becomes almost like a three-asset model. So it becomes a model where, you know, you have small durables uh, that maybe have a very small transaction cost, um, and you have another asset that is really a financial asset, say, uh, that has maybe larger transaction cost. Um, a compromise is actually what we did in, in one of the... Um, papers that I wrote with, uh, with Greg, um, where we uh, assigned, uh, a, precisely as we're suggesting, a, consum a, a consumption flow to the stock of durable. So basically what we said is that, well, the, the, I'm sorry, the stock of liquid asset. We said, so think of this liquid asset more broadly, like, for example, housing, but also, like, say, cars and all durables, right? And, uh, and let's imagine that the, the stock of liquid assets has a direct consumption flows. So it gives you some utility. So one actually uh, um, advantage of thinking of the two asset model this way is that you can generate similar data, similar NPCs, similar wealth distributions, and so on with a smaller return 
financial return gap between the two assets. Okay, in, in this in this calibration, we have a, a gap that is almost seven percent. Okay, but you, if you add obviously a uh, utility flow coming from the liquid asset, you can generate the same moments with a much much smaller return, which I think is sort of more desirable in a way, and it's you know it, it makes sense because a lot of these uh, assets. Uh, liquid assets, housing, but also private equity, um, private businesses. I think it's reasonable to think that they deliver some flow utility instantaneously, basically. Oh, well, great. Thanks. Thanks, Angelica. Okay, we, we have two more questions. So, Martina Kingberg. Maybe you have to unmute her. I am. She should be unmuted. Um, I think she's ready to talk. See what's going on here. Martin, I think you mute yourself, and he is telling me that you should ask to unmute. Okay, so I don't know what's going on. So let's try with uh, the other question. I don't know, Raymond Lidon. Um, Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Very well. Hi, Jean Luca. That was really uh, good. I learned a lot. Um, I wonder does your work and some of the work you cited have much to say about how we think about? spending from call it pandemic savings or involuntary savings or forced savings. So I work in a central bank. It's a question I get asked every week by the forecasters. Mm -hmm. My my view of that saving is it's probably liquid, but it's accrued to very wealthy households in the main or wealthier and also higher income. So I'm wondering, does your work help us think about that? Any thoughts on that? Well, yeah, look, yeah, look, we're a bit over time, so you can be brief. We will have to close. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. So then I will be extremely brief. Um, I have a paper with uh, Greg Kaplan and uh, Ben Moll and uh, um, uh, uh, Zhu uh, Fu, who is a student at the University of Chicago, that is called uh, uh, The Great Lockdown and the Big Stimulus, in which we um, sort of answer. One of the questions we ask is exactly that question. So we have a model, with, it's a version of a two-asset model that uh, generates precisely, um, you know, um, pretty much in line with the data, the spending response to the uh, economic impact payments uh, that were delivered to households uh, during the pandemic. And, you know, just to, to, again, give you a very short answer, one of the reasons why um, in the model we get that a lot of households save is two, two reasons. One is that they really could not spend uh, on what they wanted. And the second reason is that, um, you know, many of these uh, uh, sort of checks or, 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 or payments were made to households that are actually quite um, uh, wealthy or well off. And so they saved essentially most of it. Yeah. Um, because they didn't, they didn't need to spend it. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, okay very good. Thanks, everybody. We really need to, really need to stop this. Thanks, Jaluka, for the brilliant talk. And now, thank before you, you leave, thank you, thank you, everybody. Remember, there is this stand up comedian show that they are waiting for us. So please join the, the show and have a nice rest of the conference. Goodbye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you.